evening, everybody. Um, welcome to here. Um, I'm I'm Ingrid Swenson. I'm incredibly thrilled, delighted, happy to introduce um, Jade Fatajutami and Matthew Collins to the discussion this evening. And um, so they're going to talk for about I don't know 40, 45 minutes, something like that. I don't know. It's, we'll play it by ear, but. Want to open up the conversation as well, um, but just to introduce Jade, um, so an artist who lives and works in London. Um, she received her BA from the Slade School of Art in 2015 and her MA from the Royal College of Art in 2017, and she was awarded the Hyman Painting Prize. She was also shortlisted for the Con Contemporary British Painting Prize and the Griffin Art Prize. Um, Jade's just had a solo exhibition which closed a week or two ago at Gisela Capitaine in Cologne and this is her first um, exhibition, solo exhibition in an independent gallery um, and her work is now being collected by a number of very significant private and public collections so we're really thrilled to be able to present this show here. Um, Matthew Collins is an artist and a writer he studied painting at Byam Shaw School of Art and at Goldsmiths. He edited the magazine Art Scribe between 1983 and 87 and was the art critic on the BBC TV culture programme The Lake Show between 1988 and 94. He's written many books on art, including the popular bestseller Blimey, which I'm sure graces many bookshelves amongst the people in this room. Um, and this is Modern Art, which was published in 1998 by Biden Bob Nicholson. This is Modern Art, was based on a six-part six part TV series broadcast by Channel 4, which Matthew wrote and presented, and it won a BAFTA amongst other, war, uh, other awards. Since 2015, he's been a regular art critic for the Evening Standard. Matthew co collaborates on geometric patterned paintings with his partner, and the mosaicist Emma Biggs. Um, they exhibit under the name Biggs and Collins. Their work is in many collections globally and they are represented by Vigo Gallery. Matthew is currently writing a book on contemporary painting for Thames and Hudson, which is to be published at some point in the future. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll be in the book, Charlie. Uh, well, well, I should say that I, I do genuinely hope, hope you're in it because the book is about it's a sort of improvised uh, beatnik stream, really, kind of flowing through a whole book about things that I think are good about painting now. What could be, what painting could be, uh, if one thought of it in the absolute optimal way, as opposed to how it's sometimes thought of as a, as a sort of enemy of social progress or enemy of up-to-dateness. It seems to be the conservative thing you've got to avoid. Yeah. And uh, I can see why people would think that. But I think if you look at it from the positive point of view, and in a way, you know, there's a sort of philosophical uh, way of thinking where you take a negative and you put another thought with it and you give birth to a third thought, which is a sort of dialectical process. So you take the negative thing and you think about something else and then you suddenly realise how that negative thing can be turned around. And um, so my, the whole book is really me trying to do that to a lot of painters that people have heard of and then some maybe more recent ones that, that possibly not so many people have heard of. And then sometimes some very old ones that people have heard of. So I'm trying to turn them all in, inside out, turn people's ideas of painting inside out. And uh, the thing that I responded to most in your painting, not knowing anything about you, I didn't even know then that you were actually at the Slade with my daughter, yeah. Babette, although you were a year below her, I think, a couple yeah. of years. Uh, I didn't even know that the paintings were by a man or a woman. What I thought was fantastic was the a, a sort of dual sense of the paintings having absolute authority in terms of rhythm and composition, these sort of classic qualities that the paintings are supposed to have, perhaps. Absolute authority, and yet real uh, authentic energy 
where it didn't matter what the painter thought about art. There was, there was something about the paintings that they just sort of were able to claim your attention. They, they weren't, I wasn't asked to think about the history of art, mm. even though I can never help but think about them. that. On first seeing them, even as reproductions. By the time I saw the real thing, I knew a bit more that you had done them, I knew your age, I knew that you'd worked the uh, Slade and you went to the Royal College. And I also knew curious sort of things that seemed rather random and I didn't know how they fitted, like that you like Japanese anime films, and you like Japanese anime soundtracks, and you've been to Japan. And in fact, you like is an understatement of this thing. It's actually played a major role in your life. We're in a complicated relationship. <laughs> yeah, you really, you really are in a complicated relationship because I wouldn't see that in the paintings. But then I'm not someone who really knows what a Japanese anime film is. So, I mean, maybe others in the room recognise it straight away. That, uh, but talking to you earlier, I asked you about some. I asked you about this issue of you like those things. Do you therefore paint them? And your answer was not. Yes, I do, and not entirely that you don't, but maybe you could repeat yeah. or, or go into the answer. <laughs> if, if you're someone who's a fan of Japanese anime films uh, to a very profound extent, are you painting those films or how do they inspire your paintings? Um, yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people have pointed out that the things that I might even directly say, I, or at least the things that influence the work or kind of enter the work, they're not on first viewing the work quite apparent. Um, and yeah, you're right, we were talking in the back and I, was, I remember saying that because the way that things kind of feed my work, I don't directly, they're not, they don't directly translate visually. Um, for example, with anime, for me, um, I feel like a lot of the, the, I don't want to say feeling because I don't think that's the correct term to use, but the energy um, from kind of when I'm engaged with watching something or just how that can carry me away when I'm, when I'm really taken by a storyline or, or whatever, um, or kind of the cinematography of an animation, um, that feeds the way I paint. So it can feed the work in the sense that it might change the way, the speed at which I paint because, and it's probably a reason why I also love to listen to the soundtracks that I, that are behind those animations or behind a um, video game or a film. While you're working. You know, while I'm working, yeah. yeah, because it's, it's almost a return to that moment or return to that questioning. And then I'm able to kind of process that and more naturally than I would have without them, if that yeah. makes sense. But then well, I've also noticed that the things, like for example, painters that I really enjoy, like Phoebe Unman or Amy Sermon, those are just a couple. And then you have Makiko Kuban, that's a Japanese painter. But then I talk about animations, and I talk about clothes. There's always, I feel like if you put those all side by side, you'd be able to see something, you'd be able to see a visual, similarity between the two uh, or between yeah. all those op or between all those things that I've just mentioned for um, you there is a similarity. for me anyway yeah. it's yeah. obvious but even I don't think it's as it's simple to put into words because I remember when I first got into painting or at least it, I knew I wanted to use paint as a medium I always wanted to kind of understand the indescribable things that I couldn't put into words things that that would take, I was taken by, but in a way that I couldn't quite describe myself, and I wanted to understand it or translate that in painting, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And also, uh, I would say that, that you've said a lot of things, actually, so I'm going to look at some of them. <laughs> yeah. uh, but one of them that did strike me is you said, when I first thought I would use painting as a medium, and I think anyone um, coming into the show would see immediately how generously and enthusiastically paint as a medium is embraced mm -hmm. by you. Uh, and I wonder what, I mean, I know something from what you said earlier, so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna make a question out of this knowledge. 
I know that for a few years you didn't paint like this, i.e. that you didn't paint in this free, open way. Now, I'm not, for a moment, I'm, for a moment, I'm not going to characterize what I mean by free and open. I'm just going to say they look pretty free and open. Later on, we'll talk about what freedom could really mean. But I know that for a few years you didn't paint like this. There was a sort of click moment, and then you started painting like this. And I would call that, that, that sounds to me a good way of putting it, to use paint as a medium. But the way you just said it sounded like you decided to use paint as a medium a bit earlier than that. It was just that it took you a while to learn or to decide to paint in this way. So what, what do you think it really meant to you to use paint as a medium? I mean, you know, you could have, with your enthusiasms, you could have gone to an animation course and tried to be a video maker or... Yeah. I mean, Why choose paint, given you like animation? I'm not sure if I... I think the fact that I've even decided to say I chose paint is more when you go to a place like Slade and they have a fine art programme and you have to choose an area, but I'm not comparing it to choose an area. It was obvious that paint was what I wanted to do. But you didn't go to the Slade wanting to paint. It was only when they offered you that as a possibility. That's I mean, true. It's a painting it's school. But then they have all sorts of areas. They have conceptual yeah, they art, me, they have they, third area, mixed media. They have media. Museum, they have sculpture and they have painting. Um, but it's known as a painting school to, I don't know, I yeah. think people get upset. <laughs> but you <laughs> went the, you like painting that. straight away? Or? No, I, I painted straight you away. Did. I think it was more when you weigh up the options, the others didn't appeal to me. Yeah. It's like the best of the three. Okay, well, yeah. what was it about? Was it that paint is very direct? Anyone can dip a paint in some a brush in some medium and get it. I think it's because I love color. I love color. So color was so, the issue. So I More want. I remember making. wanting to use color. Yeah. And that was what I started off with painting. I, actually, when I started the slide, I remember saying I wanted to paint to music, um, and that's what I was doing in my first year. But also, I never even considered, despite loving Japanese animations, I never even thought I wanted to do animation. I just, I mean. I knew what I can and can't do. I wasn't very interested in right. in the making of animations and I definitely didn't want to make them and I knew it just, I'm not really capable. <laughs> right, way. right. So there yeah. were two things. One is an enthusiasm for animation and for Japan, actually, because as it's the origin of yeah. anime. But the other thing was uh, a desire to paint. That, you, that seemed a good thing to do. And... Although it took you a while to get to this very, very immersive type of painting, uh, painting was certainly something you wanted to Although do. I will say, I, even my paintings before were quite immersive. What was the clicking point then? What changed from one thing to this thing? You say that yeah. Phil Allen said you're a bit too uptight with your use of the materials. Oh yeah, but I was holding back how much I was using. Or He could tell when he looked at my previous work that I was precious over how much paint I was using or how much medium I was using. And after that, I thought, oh yeah, you're probably right. He could almost tell that in the paintings because it felt like I didn't, it felt like the paintings were starved in that sense. Um, and after that, I started really, I did the complete opposite. I would kind of almost waste the material in making work. And that really freed me up. Um, I feel like that's a part of it, but I think also, I think the a part of that change is how I use mark. Um, I feel like my work's always felt, um, what's the term used? Uh, like I could submerge myself into them because I was very engaged with them feeling like an environment. And I was really, I still dealt with the same kind of scale. Maybe I've gone a bit bigger with this one on the um, right there, but did you always make very free marks like this? What do you mean by free? Well, it's a good question. <laughs> you know, anyone who does any painting knows that there's not really any such thing as freedom. But I mean, marks free of depiction to some extent. A mark where you don't really know what the mark is supposed to be. You're just oh, making okay. a mark. You know? um, Did you used yeah. to paint figuratively and then you changed? No, I've always been um, abstract if that's what we want yeah, to that, call. If that's a helpful word. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, Marks, you know, looking around to the, at the three paintings here and our, our memory of the paintings in there, you, if somebody said, well, what kind of paintings should you do? Well, they have uh, very rhythmic marks. That are, it's as if she's making one mark in response to other yeah. marks around the painting. You know? yeah. I don't know if you would recognise that Actually, because, no, because people always ask me, so what kind of paintings do you make? 
And in all honesty, I don't think there's a way for me to describe them, so I pull out Instagram and I just show them. And I think that's the best way. I think people can only, I think, the best description to someone else of what the kind of work you make is how they see it in their eyes. I mean, I even know how to, even the way I describe my work is very personal to me. It's not necessarily, yeah. without seeing an image, I don't think it would really mean anything. Um, One thing that characterizes all the paintings is a very both generous and careless, as it were, in that you're not worried about it. Generous and careless use of uh, liquid medium, this weird stuff that you can get that's a kind of substitute for, for so it's the a synthetic version in a way of linseed oil and types. But what it does is it allows you to paint very transparently and fast, I guess. I don't, I don't know if you would agree. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. It extends the paint. The and in the film, version. if anyone's seen it, you're chucking in the medium in <laughs> yeah. those tinfoil palettes. And, and it, I guess, yes, it extends the marks and it mm -hmm. lends speed to the whole mm -hmm. operation. It's that, the use of that medium, did that come at a certain point? Or were you always aware of? I used you, it from the beginning, actually. Right, yeah, right. I've always used liquid, probably not as not in the same quantities as I do now, but yeah. I remember even my first, oh no, my first painting display didn't use liquid. But I think after my first painting, I don't even remember who introduced me to liquid actually. Yeah. Someone definitely did because I didn't know anything about painting when I went to play. I didn't even, I wouldn't have known what kind of mediums they were there were or what kind of colors there were it might when i started slide was really what when i began to learn about art or painting in general before then i was i was actually really into illustration and, yeah <laughs> and fashion but i didn't i never i never wanted to study those things um the paintings to me look like art and i think of a lot of paintings in the history of art when i see them but they also uh, which was what I was trying to say at the beginning, that they have a fantastic, they have the authority of art, but they also are sort of upsetting what I know. They seem like something new, which is, which is absolutely at ease with itself. You know, it's, it's a sort of a making that is slightly different from painting to painting, but I obviously can tell that they're by the same artist. And they are doing things that perhaps other artists might be self-conscious about doing. They might mm. think, oh, I better not do a mark like that because that's been done before. Or, I better mm. not fill in the corner like that. I recognise that from some other painter. Mm. And you seem to have no prohibition it's very of hard. that kind. Yeah, it's very hard to think like that when you don't have the same vast knowledge as other artists. I mean, I'm sure there's... I, when I, I'm just talking about my own experience of talking to people at school or talking to people I meet, I've always, I've always recognised at least that, especially because my interest started at Slade, um, there's, not, there's not many things that can distract me in that sense. And um, when it comes to things like trying to avoid doing something within a painting, because I recognise it from somewhere I've seen it, it's usually in the past painting that I've done. And that's how I, I feel like that's probably also why my paintings do differ in the making from each one because that's what I'm more concerned with, of, with, yeah, completely. I'm not really afraid of my work kind of looking like someone else's, probably more so now that I've really found um, a way of making that I'm really excited by. But actually probably at um, art school, I might have felt like that, but I think that's because art school puts that into you. I think that's what students put into you. Um, and yeah. It sounds like you have a sort of culture of your own art in your head. When you say that, you, that you're more thinking about the last painting you did mm. than about the paintings that Kandinsky really did. No, it's not <laughs> at all arrogant, it's very honest. Mm. And also it makes sense, I think, from what we're looking at, that we see yeah. it's as if each painting creates the urge for the next one, the next set of impulses. That They're not opposites, but they're differences. Mm. I suppose this would take us on to another, another way of looking at the show that... In a minute, I must ask you to tell me what some of the paintings mean, but when I think, when I think about them as paintings, mm. I think of, for example, 
that one related to this one related to this oh. one. Each seems to have its own logic and it seems very satisfying to me the way uh, the logics alter from one to another. Mm. There's a relatedness and a profound difference. So it's a different kind of sort of meal from one to the other or a different set of bodily movements that mm. one might want to make because one's made enough of those mm. movements yeah. in that painting. But also I would say that they are not just records of your satisfactions, they are also objectively very impressive in the way that each has its own, I'm not sure if this is the right way of saying it, but its own colour key, you know, they make absolute sense as colour individually. Mm. I, I sort of believe in that picture, I believe in that little handkerchief of spotted yellow that appears over there, or the butterflies of yellow that flitter through it. And I, also believe it when people aren't sitting there it looks like a row of people maybe holding sticks in the corner or, or a, an that, explosion or does something. Does that individuality then kind of make you believe in each painting more would you say? Yes exactly that's a very good way of putting it because it has authentic as a sort of overused word but because it has a sort of believable mm. individuality it's like a graphic thing it's not quite a picture but it feels it has the satisfactions of a picture mm. And then this one uh, uh, has all of those things, but in a different way. Uh, that's the way I find content in the paintings. Mm. It's as if you, the, the paintings have enough to them that I don't need to know their titles mm. or hear any explanation about them. However, you are here. And, uh, <laughs> I think we, it would be good to hear some explanations about them. I mean, you, you spoke a little bit. Of, I don't know if you spoke in the film about your titles or if I've read something that you said, but how I know the titles are important to you for the sound of the words, but how mm. important are they to you for conveying content, as it were? Um, I wouldn't say the titles are for anyone apart from myself. Yeah. For me, they're a way of understanding or look my relationship with the work because um, they're associations, they're things that just sit naturally or what I think when I see the work. and. Often when I title a piece, I'm like, oh, oh yeah. But the oh yeah moment isn't a, that's perfect for the work. It's like, of course, that's what I was, what was going into the work when I was making it. And I can see a direct connection to maybe an experience that's happened recently or where a mood I've been in or something I've watched. And it's almost, I, I feel like a lot of painters do the same thing, not in terms of titling, but you, you do and then you think afterwards or you look back and I feel like that's what the titles are for me. They, they become another stepping stone to a journey of, of whatever it is I'm trying to question. What, could you remind me of what the title of this is? I'm pir pirouetting the night way. I'm, a, I'm pirouetting the night way <laughs> and this is the painting that we see you painting in the film, I think. Yeah. We see you down at the bottom there making some of those marks. When you said just now, you know, maybe the title summons up experiences that you ha you've had. I think that you're s saying, am I right, that maybe the painting summons up experiences that you've had. It's only my own experiences and all the works. And, <laughs> and when you say yeah. your experiences, I mean, I'm thinking that you mean that the paintings then are sort of metaphors for that. So, or, do you, or do you think that's, for you, that's mm. a picture of your life in some way, an aspect of your life? I think it's, I think, those two options are probably it's neither and both if that makes sense i think it's more complicated than that i think a lot of my titles are a lot more layered just i feel like the titles are just as layered as the works um are physically and for me i feel like with, with that work for example you know i didn't title that work thinking about how i work as a painter, but yeah. it seemed, but it's funny for me because in retrospect at the title, it's like actually when I'm painting, there's kind of a, you can see the direct relationship, but that's not what's gone into the title. Um, for example, no, this isn't helophobia, yeah. hibernation. <laughs> hibernation. <laughs> yeah. Um, this painting, like I always say to people, I'm hibernating right now, please don't speak to me. Um. <laughs> for the, in the mornings or no, just, in the I winter? Have, I have periods where I don't want to talk to anyone, mm. but I've always described that as hibernating. Hibernate. But I never, I didn't go into the painting thinking I want to, or I, 
I didn't, I didn't go into any work ever thinking, oh, I, now it's time to discuss I get it, I get hibernation. It, yeah. But in retrospect, it's like actually it's, it's, it makes sense that this yeah. painting would be titled that, to me at least. And I think for others in respect of knowing me or hearing me speak, um, it's usually a visual relationship that yeah. determines the title. But I think ultimately it's a lot more complicated than that. It's like bringing surface to the surface your subconsciousness when you're working if that makes sense, or your subconscious thoughts, or your subconscious, if that makes sense. It makes sense, certainly in terms of if I think, I think I hear you saying that you didn't set out to paint this picture. You didn't know what really you were mm. going to paint. Having painted it, hibernation made sense because hibernating is something you do psychically. Mm. You didn't set out to paint that thing that you do mm. psychically, but you recognize, you're always going to recognize yourself in the paintings. You recognize, Mm. This sort of made sense as a sort of bridge to some mm. your inner being in a way. Uh, it felt right to you. Mm. Um, it's interesting that each of the paintings are not pre-thought. It's not that you, even to the extent that you didn't think it was necessarily going to be, uh, you know, in, can everybody remember the painting through that's very dark and it has a sort of swirling vortex in that's the middle? Terrible, yeah. You didn't start out with a circular idea in your mind. I, was torturing you earlier and saying exactly what did you, you start? You were torturing me. And you had, to, <laughs> you had to really think about it, didn't mm. you? And it was a sort of curve at the top. Mm. And that was the beginning. And then, so then I thought, I see. So you, does that mean you started with that mark? And then I don't even think that was the beginning. That's right. what I can remember. Yeah. But um, the, starts of, the start of each painting is usually very empty. Um, it's usually a reckon or finding something with, with, while well, I've already put on the canvas, that will lead to a defining start, if another start, beginning, if that makes sense. Yeah. Which is probably yeah. why I said also pressure. That was pressure. pressure. <laughs> so in a way, you start kind of banally with nothing, and then you find a start. Yes. And then you start to get something, exactly. and then you start pursuing the something. Yeah. So, so the something might be the vortex yeah. in that painting, or. It, or indeed the sort of vortex in oh, this painting. Maybe the best way to describe it is like a different chapters, different starts to different chapters. Because I think even I could give you another start to a moment that brought the painting to the image we have now, um, another defining feature, because at that point, I, I would, my kind of engagement of the work changed because I realized something else. And it feels like there are many, there, even though the paintings can be made quite quickly, there's still chapters within the making. Yeah. And, uh, you're, and you're vaguely aware of those stages or chapters, as you call them, as you're working? Yeah, because I think there's, there's, a, there's a clear change in my pace whilst I'm working. Yeah. The faster I'm working, it's probably because I've been excited by that new chapter and I've yeah. recognised something. Yeah. And then the end of the chapter is sitting down and like, hmm. And yeah. then I find the start again. That's a great way of putting it. I imagine the first chapter with it's things like, you know, simple words, hello, <laughs> I've begun the book. But by about chapter four, there's some really complicated thoughts going. Yeah, exactly. And once the complicated thoughts go, then you're in the business, yeah. really. And it's not as if you think, oh, you know, God, if only I could start at chapter four every time. You actually, there has to be chapters one, two, and three. Exactly, yeah. That they are the way you've talked about them, perhaps because of my encouragement, it's certainly true to how they seem, which is that they are very abstract, although they're, they're very bodily, I don't, but maybe that's abstract. It's an abstraction of the body that we're seeing. Mm. You know, they feel like movements, it feels like your movements. Mm. I say that's a little bit colored by the image of you making them, because I see you making them so physically. Mm. But, but they are like traces of the body, and the canvas mm. seems sort of um, receptive to the body's movements, mm. you know. And the marks seem to be made very, uh, rith rather than like this, where you sort of embellish something, they seem to be made to express the whole being. Do you think that abstract is a useful word? Mm, I think it's useful probably for other people, but, it's, but only in order to... No, I don't. 
it's a term that could that sort of cries out to be filled in to some extent. Yeah. But but would you say that would you I, even say that they I are just, abstract paintings? Oh, I do it for people. I don't know. I don't know. I think there's too many gaps in language yeah. to even describe the work. Um, I think there's not I think I think we need to increase our art vocabulary a bit to kind of suit I don't know. Well what about if you <laughs> described one mark? One mark. Yeah, like if we looked over there, yeah. there's a mark that is the last black mark, as it were, coming out from the right. I don't, I'm calling it black. Wait, maybe. right? You're, wait. Yeah, oh, here. from the right, these very dark marks. Yeah. They go out there and that there, and then there's a sort of brownish version of the... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Right there, that's a long mark like that. Mm. And it's got a bit of a yeah. break into it with mm. some orange in the middle. Are we looking at the same thing? Yeah, I think so. That gentleman okay. with the beard is just sitting right next to it. Yeah. That, that great big long mark there. What, yeah. Would you say that was an abstract mark? No. So what does it describe? Or what is it? What were you thinking when you made it? <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking when I made it? Yeah, I can't even describe what I did yesterday. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were to re think, reconstruct in your mind now. I think for me, the decision to place that mark at the time, it felt naturally obvious but where the mark has come from is an, is an ambiguous representation of something if that makes sense you feel you feel that it is it, and yeah. when you did it you felt that it was yes but the decision wasn't to bring whatever form i wanted to into the painting it, it was more of a reaction it made sense to place that there but where the use of that line mm. is also a representation of something for me well, I think you might be saying, oh, I hear it. Does that make sense? I don't know. I, I okay. think you're saying that the mark causes the painting to represent something, or mm -hmm. causes the painting to. So you think the, think, the mark think, itself represents something? The thing that I'm getting at is that without the mark, the painting, the, where the painting yeah. would be, or what it would look like now, it'd probably be completely different. It's like a domino effect. Yeah. And so the reason for placing the mark, there might not have been much thought behind it. But the mark exists as a representation of something to me. Okay, yeah. yeah. What, what was it? I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Do, is, are you not telling me because you're, you don't know? Or? It's not important. It's just, right, right. It's not important. Right. It would be, a, it would, <laughs> it, because, it would yeah. close down the meaning of the work. No, but it's also because that's not the reason why the works become what they are. For me, I'm trying to recognize or figure something out as well so yeah. it might be part of the puzzle but the completed puzzle is even um surprising to me yeah. and it's that finished piece it's not the individual pieces of the puzzle that are important but it's the puzzle as a whole good i like that that's good <laughs> i mean it sounds like something oh it looks the painting looks like it's sort of becoming in various directions mm. but you're saying that that's me because I don't know your in, inner being. But you're saying, for you, in some ways, it's a sort of map of some kind of inner you. Mm. That you do, you feel that you do know what is formed in mm. that picture, what is hinted at yeah. in the forms of that picture. Yeah. But it's not necessary for anybody else to know that. But also, even though I might know what different forms represent to me, I don't see them as those forms anymore once the image is complete. I see, yes. They've so lost the meaning see. or identity yes, in the process. Yes, they're forms for you as you're working. Yes. Right. And the whole painting is the container of those forms or the painting is a form itself? The forms don't matter. Yeah. Yeah, I just, they're very separate. Yeah. It's, it's almost... I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, I don't want to undermine their use by calling them tools, so they're not tools either. I think because they intuitively make sense as to why I place them in the work and I don't necessarily overthink what they are when I'm making or why I'm putting it in, they become part of it, but they've played their part once I've put it down and now, yeah. you know, I say goodbye and I say hello to something else in the work. 
in the work. Yeah, it's like the... a stream of thought that... Yeah, yeah. The... So something is formed and then it's time for another form yes. that's going to affect that form. And then I forget about the previous form. So it each form is like a bridge to another one. You throw the bridge away once you're yeah, on it's another like, one. It's, yeah. yeah, it's like abandoning children in the process, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It does make It does make sense. And yeah. maybe each painting is also a child that can be abandoned in another one. <laughs> yeah. But um, do you... Do you does the painting end up with the colours that you first mixed or do you change um, the key in the middle? I might start with a certain colour and then... No, I don't pre-mix all the colours right. for the work. Yeah. I rarely do that. Yeah. I might do if there's colours they want to play with. Yeah. Um, but I mix as I go... If there were colours that you wanted to play with, that would be because in the last painting you didn't have them or you yeah, saw them in someone else's painting? because I've seen something and I'm like, oh, I want to try those colours. Right. And it can be anything from walking on the street and seeing something on the ground to watching an animation to the clothes I've been wearing. I'm like, oh, that's nice. And then that will make me pre-mix. Um, but I would still add colours in the process, but I'm going to mix as I go along. When you, the colours uh, that you start out with, are they subtle tones or strong colours squirted into medium or a mixture of, the t of a mm. combination of the two? Uh, subtle tones. Oh, like muddy, indistinct tones, or oh. are they bright orange, bright blue? Oh, it really depends. So they really change. I mean, I've never been a muddy, I don't like muddiness. I'm right. not a muddy person. So you saturated <laughs> but colour. Interestingly, yeah. though, the painting in the other room uh, called I'm Presenting Your Royal Highness. Um, that oh, that's the tall one, yeah? Yes. Yeah. That painting... It's all fleshy and red. Yes. Yeah. Um, that painting, actually, I remember when I went into that work, I remember feeling frustrated about what felt to me. My palette was becoming familiar. And so I forced myself to kind of empty different tubes of paint into the colours I was already using right. and just mix without caring and just go straight into the painting. And for me, that was very difficult, but liberating at the same time. Sometimes I feel like when I really want to make or kind of make each work separate from the last, I have to force myself out of those habits because I think it's very hard to actually decide or ignore what you want from a work if you naturally, are, for example, like certain colours. And so that kind of was a tactic to or an exercise to yeah. at least prove to myself that I can still make a painting that um, I can enjoy, that yeah. doesn't follow the same kind of relationship. Or, or for me, that's muddy. Right. For other people, it might not be muddy, I if that makes sense. <laughs> it has a certain muddiness, but I think of it as a, a beautiful mixture of... Uh, See, fleshy, bloody, ready stuff and entrailly muddy shadows. Mm. It's an explosion. Yeah. Of, um, I think also that's probably because at the end of the day, I know what satisfies me in painting. Yeah. And even though it's not obviously a different use of colour or as what muddy is to someone else, the, the change in the language of that painting compared to my others came from that. It was suddenly like because I wasn't, I was forcing myself to just let it happen within the palette. I didn't even care too much about the directions of Mark as much more. As right. Like my kind of natural, I didn't appreciate the paint yeah. as I usually do. So With it, that red painting? Yes, yeah, yeah, so it translated to how I made the painting. I see, I see. So you sort of, in a way, alienated yourself. You had to alienate yourself from the colours in order to do that yeah. painting. And when you referred earlier, a few seconds ago, to that was difficult, that's what you meant, because mm. they weren't colours that you naturally like. Mm. And is it so that um, when you uh, start out with either one colour or a combination of colours, even if you saw something in the street that was like that, or you saw somebody else's painting that perhaps suggested that to you, the impulse, that the, the attraction is a lot because of the painting you just did, that it's some kind of difference to that painting. You need to do something different now. Oh, uh, I feel like the, the fascinate, or do, is, are you asking me when I'm taken by something, whether it's on the street or yeah. something engaging? Yeah, is it because of what you were just doing? You need 
to refresh yourself in some different way? Or? No, I feel like it's as simple as when you're window shopping and you find something unexpected and, you're, right. and it's still hovering in your mind. And you want to re replicate that somehow. Yeah, but I don't think it's, I want to understand why it's hovering in the first place. Yeah. I think it's a better way because I think that's part of the reason why people don't necessarily see that visual relationship I discussed before. It's because it's not about actually what it is, it's why it's bugging me or why yeah. it's haunting me or stalking me. But those all sound quite negative. I think it's quite wonderful. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, if that makes sense. I'm thinking about the answer to that, if it makes sense. And while I'm thinking, I'm looking at that buzzing um, uh, red and crimson and whitish sort of nest or hovering mist with midges in it or whatever. I have no idea what you're talking about. That area, <laughs> the area in the corner there, it's got the yellow, um, the oh. yellow shape with the dots in it. All around oh, it, there's see. a sort of big hole so, oh, or a I mist see. or something. Oh, okay. And I was just wondering if uh, that came from a logic that's purely of that painting or if it was something that you needed to do in the sense that you're now talking about how you begin a painting. You know, oh, that, I see. That seems like a... I would have no difficulty uh, in saying, well, there's a, there's a form in that painting. Yeah. And now I wonder, um, is that a form that you wanted to make? You wanted to make one like that as opposed to one where marks sort of close off the mist, as it were. I think for this painting, I actually had a kind of gesture in mind for the painting. Right. Um, especially where well, the title of the show is The Numbing Vibrancy of Characters in Play. I wish it wasn't that long now because I had to say it. But um, it's the, the idea that I was trying to um, kind of, uh, what do you call it? Explore? No. What do, you, what do people do at art school again when they're trying to like play with things? But they don't know what <laughs> Experiment. experiment, thank you. Thank you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this whole show was an experiment for me. In what? In the sense that I felt like my work, for me, I could see um, characters um, or figures, as maybe right. people would describe them as, and I wanted to, well, in the beginning, it frustrated me because yeah. I didn't like them going closer to that end of the spectrum, even though they're still abstract to people. But then at some point, I feel like you can't really necessarily control where your work's going. Sometimes it takes a natural direction. Yeah. And this show was an embracement of that and bringing them to more of a center um, stage within the work. But then also those paintings as characters themselves. And so that kind of area you're talking about for me is probably an anchor down in that sense. Right. That idea. That ab absolutely makes sense. Yes. So maybe the white thing is another character. Who knows? Maybe. And, <laughs> and so I, I like the idea that maybe the whole painting is a character and maybe it contains characters. Exactly. And maybe in the language of art critics, they're sort of um, figures in a space. Mm. But of course, they're not spelled out figures, so they're not necessarily. Uh, I, mean, I think nature is recognisable, but humans are less recognisable. Mm. But the body's movements and a sort of a human sense mm. is definitely mm. receivable. But then why the do you say human? Because they could... That's a good question. Yeah. Yes, they might be uh, insects or they might, they might be micro scenes or I macro hate scenes. Insects, yeah. by the way. But, sorry? <laughs> I hate insects, by the way. Oh, you hate it, though. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Why do I say human? I suppose in the positive sense that they seem very human, mm -hmm. but that they seem to be marks made by a human rot and, in, and enjoying that, mm -hmm. uh, and in, a human that lives and breathes in space and has a bodily form and, mm -hmm. and is encountering other bodies. Mm -hmm. They seem to be about those kind of sensations, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not insisting that they are, but that would be something that I, would, I find sympathetic about them. Mm. But I always, I, my... I feel like our first instinct, or the first thing we'll always recognise, is a human anyway, because it's a kind of, it's a bridge towards something. It's suddenly, suddenly yes. like, if I can find something that looks like me, then maybe I can understand it a bit better. Yes. Um, I've never said they were humans. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, who knows? <laughs> yeah. um, well, when you talk <laughs> about characters, I suppose that's what made me, um, I mean, I, I had thought that they were rather human anyway. 
But when you talked about characters, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, well, does she mean animated characters? Yeah. But of course, it's an open question as to whether the characters in anime films are human. I mean, they're, they're sort of yeah. strange constructs of <laughs> fantasies, really. Mm. It's a whole other yeah. parallel world. Yeah, I feel like characters is even the problem, going back to when I said chapters, yes. uh, using that analogy, yeah. when you refer to characters in a, in a book, for example, yeah. like, for example, what's that children's book, The Caterpillar it Eats Things? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The Caterpillar is a character, but yeah. he's not human. Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, that's right, it's not human, yeah. I mean, with the children... You're the writer. <laughs> yeah, what do I know? Yeah. Actually, talking of what do I know, maybe it's time we had some questions from the audience. Because uh, we've, been, we've been talking in a certain way because I've been always asking about the paintings in terms of how they first appear. And maybe there are other ways to talk about content, you know, that I haven't allowed in. Yes, you're putting your hand up. I'm really curious about, there's a beautiful little sort of catalog of writings that you've done oh, yeah. in yes. addition to the show, and I'm really curious to hear a bit more, like an elaboration on that. Um, well, the writings in that little booklet were an extraction from, I have a few notebooks, I tend to write alongside painting, and it was something I really stumbled into because I never, wasn't very didn't believe in my writing and it was actually doing my dissertation at um, RCA that made me feel like I could write um, because I remember my tutor at the time saying, do you feel like he could tell that I was nervous or I didn't, I didn't have any confidence in writing and he, and he said, why don't you just go home and write about anything because you're probably think, feeling that way because you think there's a certain way to write. So. I wrote that piece, The Window. And it's funny that that's, we use that all the time when showing people my work because it came from literally that kind of advice from my tutor. But since then, I felt like I can just put down thoughts. And a lot of the writings are actually happen whilst they're making the work. And they're not, they're, the works don't need the writings and the writings don't, what I think, they don't need the works either. It's more like a reaction, just like, I need to, I think, oh, I'm going to put this line here. I might actually run and write something down in between painting. And so I, I see the writings as thoughts, their way of processing my journey in the work. Um, and then I always look back at them ret like retrospectively. I'm like, oh, oh, even though sometimes they even make sense to me, but they make sense when I look at the work. Um, but maybe it's not right back for everyone, I don't know. But they're fun, and and I I enjoy make, um, writing them, and I'm surprised even now that people say you can write because I would never have imagined that people would be interested in them. They're literally it's just like having a silly thought, and I put it down. What did you make of um, Jodie's writings? You said you were intrigued by them. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that there's something about this sort of orchestration. Um, in a way, you say that you weren't interested in becoming an animator, but then you have sort of this play mm. of writing and mm. these sort of scenes that you've created, and there's a very sort of script-like quality to that that I love. And then there's also this sort of way in which the idea of character is really interesting to me because it's almost like the if you were to animate a being, wouldn't necessarily have to be mm. um, human or animal or anything. Mm. The character is sort of this. The, paint, the marks, the mm. painting itself. So mm. you sort of cast these characters, as it were, these marks, as it were, mm. and then you've also created this kind of script might not be the right word for it at mm. all, actually, but in a way that is a sort of mm. animation that you've done. And so mm. I find that relationship between the two and some of the mm. content of what you've been describing today to be sort of yeah. something I wanted to hear more about. Yeah, really interesting. that specific piece, I think there's like an introductory piece and then there's the longer writing or maybe it's hard to realize that because of the way the um, booklet has been like the style of it or the ups and downs whatever it's doing um, so but in a way you sort of have a narrative and you have the writing and you have the painting where's the narrative <coughs> I, I mean, I'd say, I, I mean, there's, mm, there's no narrative, I'd say. I think that just as I go into a painting, 
not necessarily know, knowing what it is I'm going to paint. I start writing not knowing where the writing's going um, either. That's why I call them thoughts, because we don't consciously think. You don't, you don't plan what you're going to think. They just pop into your head. Do you think the uh, written, the, 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 the writings are about something, that each bit of writing is about something, or is it a, an outpouring of words that feels right? I think it's an outpouring of words that feels right and then naturally becomes about something. Right, in the sense that this became about something and hibernation sort of titled it, but it didn't exactly... Yeah. I think someone yeah. even said to me, you write like you paint. Yes. And well, think, do you think that you do? Um, if that's... Yeah, maybe. I guess he yeah. hearing the way I'm describing the writings, I'd, I'd say probably, yeah. Mm. Um, I don't think, I think it's just like I probably behave like I paint, I don't know, Every, everything's, very, <laughs> every, everything is, is, I mean, I think one of the great things about being an artist or a painter is it's not, it doesn't end at the work, it's usually beyond, the work is beyond the painting, it's, it's the artist and it's, you can always, I don't know, there's, it's like dog owners match their dogs, if that makes sense. <laughs> That's very, that's very good way of putting it, yeah. So, yeah, you do match your paintings, but the thing is you have a way of um, answering questions and describing what you do when you're asked that is sort of uh, believable in that moment. Maybe in the way that you have a, a way of animating a mark, actually, which is believable. So there is a continuity between your performance of your own self and, and the paintings that you make. and. I suppose, yes, in the writing as well. Um, they do seem to be a continuum. You know, there are painters who, who, you know, painters, of course, paint in all sorts of ways and for all sorts of reasons, but there are painters who, who actually make a mental effort to be very objective about what they've made yeah. and to separate themselves as people mm -hmm. from, from the objects yeah. that they make. And also, I think when I'm saying, like, the whole dog owner analogy, I don't think it's as simple as, as um, like, a visual relationship. I'm not yeah. saying that at all. Yeah. It can be even the way they think. Yeah. The work makes sense. You you never look at someone's work and the artist and be like, mm, I don't get why where's that's where it's coming from or <laughs> how are you making this? You don't. I think the lack of questioning that is because it it doesn't need questioning. Yeah. If that makes sense. I think that happens all the time when you see work and how on earth does that come from? Oh really? Yeah. Sorry, you think it happens all the time with all art or with, no, in, no, with no, the, these works? It's a common, not here. All right. Mm. Yeah. Definitely the between these oh, oh, I see. Yeah. I often encounter art. Oh, okay, because I make it easy for people. I just <laughs> wear certain things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, and the, um, you know, the paintings have a sort of exuberant yeah. display yeah. personality. Maybe it's an art thing then. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's more artists and people that maybe are engaged with the arts that maybe have that lack of questioning and for someone that isn't really engaged with it in the same depth, um, maybe it's not as obvious as to me or to them as it is to me. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> uh, would anyone else like to ask a question that they felt they couldn't because I was talking so much. How long you, uh, yes, David, sorry. I was thinking, how long does it take to make a painting? Oh, oh someone yeah. else. Was, was it the same question? Because <laughs> 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 <I was, laughs> yeah, I think there's a great strength for them. For me, it's like, I feel like there's a lot of layers, and obviously mm. the liquid actually is quite transparent, but mm. each layer is very distinct. And although there's mm. a, lot, a lot of wet into wet, and the sliding around, there's the, even the sliding around on top. There's it's very kind of just it feels like they've been allowed to dry, and then yeah. on top as well. It's just yeah, really... liquid only take doesn't take very yeah. long to dry. In fact, I remember the choice of liquid came from because I like to work fast. I like to work with fast dry mediums because at least that allows me to make layers. So usually by the next day it's dry. And do you work? From day to day to day, or Some sometimes them, they go in one go. Some of them are in one go. Mm -hmm. Some of them are like three days. Some of them are two days. Right. So a few yeah. days from one day to a few days. Yes. And do you work all the time, or? 
Um, it's hard to tell actually because since graduating, I've always had something to work towards. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know, did I work all the time when I was at RCA? Did I? I think I kind of, I partied too. I partied and, and painted at the same time. <laughs> I've always found, yeah. The so balance. you would be happy working every day or you have to hibernate sometimes and not work? Or? I only need to hibernate from people so I'm uh, more likely to see my paintings more than I see people. And you um, have your studios in Pe Peckham? I yes, think, or it South is, yeah. Peckham, yeah. And do you go there most days then? I suppose that's my question. I, I do go most yeah. days unless I've just had something like this and then I you take... You've got something else to do. Yeah. yeah. Because you said you knew yeah. that, that mm. was what you wanted to work with. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, that was her initial yeah, desire. That was your, yeah. yeah, that was oh. the thing that pulled you into painting. Mm. So, what were you doing before painting? What, how did color? How did you engage with color before that? Um, what was the excitement? In choice of what I wear, in choice of the things. I remember when I bought my first laptop. Oh, I didn't buy it. My dad. When my dad mm. bought me <laughs> my first laptop, I had the choice between a laptop that was the exact same laptop as a black one and then there was a red one and the red one was probably a, it was a lot more expensive than the black one and I had to have the red one <laughs> because color was important <laughs> and I hadn't started painting them but that's always been the case I'm more likely to go out of my way to get something because of what it what color it is rather than actually whether it logically or <laughs> makes sense um, so when you said that color was a compelling thing for you in painting, you were not so much thinking about the joining of colours as colour as an object, a sort of mm. colour itself, you know, a coloured thing mm. is an exciting prospect for you. Yeah, I mean, I think probably my relationship with colour has developed since then because part of the reason, like anything I put into work, it's trying to understand why it's so important to me. Um, because these are very much about harmonies of colour. So yeah. So that's a development in a way. You, you might start out thinking, yeah, I, th oh, I love colour, but now I like balancing them. Well, the way I'd even, for example, choosing the red laptop over the black one was about harmony of, of me. Right. It's like a part of the image, but it's not like I'm trying to, it's not a persona, it's not trying, it's just, I've always cared, even before I cared about what I look like, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, yeah. It's all, there's always been some, it, if anything, it drives, me into making a decision. Colour? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you've always known that um, there was this thing yeah. in the world, colour, that you were yeah. interested in. Actually, the best that I remember when I, my first, like, when colour was a decisive tool for deciding things, I was obsessed with a green coat as a kid. I always had to wear my green coat. It's not in the same way that people have to, like, they always have, I have a favourite toy, it's just the colour of that coat was me and I had to, you know, I wasn't going anywhere with that green coat and I, and I could tell there were moments with everything like that, yeah, since then. Do you think you collect colours, like do you keep, the, like, do you feel like colours that have been there for a long time then run through other things, through What do you mean, collect colours as objects or collect colours as... I not objects, but... I don't know really. <laughs> like I mean, characters, I suppose, in a way. You mean. Or shades of characters, or. I, I guess I. If I. Oh, actually. I guess, for example, if I see something in the street, and obviously I, I can't necessarily take it with me, I can't take a whole tree, but that's why I have to use it in the painting. If I walk past a nice little clothing, no matter how much is in my bank account, I have to have it. So <laughs> I collect in different I collect in different ways. It's always been a problem. It's just like the laptop whole thing. I put, I put myself into debt because I had to buy something that I couldn't afford. But you know the color. I mean, who would say no to that? Um, and I've always had that mentality. So I think I collect in different ways. I if if I can obtain something, then I will I will get it because of that color. But I don't necessarily need to be able to do that. Um, you can collect in various forms. You can collect even in memories, and, they, and even that's fine. When you've got something that's a lovely colour, mm. do you like looking at it in the world with all the other colours? You mean like, do I hold it against no, the world? No, you say you've got your red laptop and you 
Yeah. Put it down to place and see, oh, it looks nice with those colours. Oh, a hundred percent, especially with my bedroom. Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, it, it's worth it. Look how the laptop goes with those curtains. Yeah. There's a person there I'd like to ask something. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, in the film that's on here, you were doing sketching on an iPad. Oh yeah. So yeah. is it, is it why you're painting? To make decisions or before you? Yeah, it's, it's something actually I started doing recently. It's quite lucky that I sport, spilt tea on my laptop because I didn't have my laptop, but I was going to Japan. When I'm in Japan, I like to write, and I and I I mean I write on the laptop as well, but I also handwrite. And so um, I think because I had to wait for insurance, so I couldn't afford one. I don't remember what it was. I bought an iPad instead because it was uh, it just made sense. And then because I had the iPad, I was like, oh, but how does this pen thing work? I played with it with painting and, and the, the use of iPad has actually been a way to step back without stepping back, if that makes sense. There's something, I remember even Phil Allen said to me, have you ever tried taking a photo of your work? Because sometimes you can realise things or if you take a photo of your work and then you like the photograph more, <laughs> then you can realise what, what you need to do to your painting. And so I started taking photos in, whilst making my works and then working on top on the iPad just to get rid of, also to get rid of moments of hesitation. Sometimes, because I don't decide colours beforehand, I might, I've always painted and taken, taken risks at the same time. And I, would, I wouldn't say the iPad has taken away risks, but what it has done is allowed me to play more without having to just go with what I already have. So I might put on a transparent layer of purple on the iPad, but then hide that layer and then try another colour and it's just opened a whole new potential to the direction of the work. This painting used the iPad a lot in that sense and the colours wouldn't be what they were without the iPad. It does sound as though the iPad is a very useful conceptual tool for you for um, pr producing ideas rather than that you do something on there and yeah. then you put it in the painting. Yeah. It turns over your mind in the way that it exactly. needs to be turned over to produce the painting. Yeah. Do you use the brushes app or something else? Well, oh, I just use whichever, oh, as simple as, you know when they advertise the iPad Pro, they're like, hey, see what it can do with Pro Art. I just use that. I haven't even tried anything else. <laughs> yeah. Now, I've got to ask somebody to ask a very long question. I mean, I remember it was, um, I remember one of the uh, little quotes I have in my notebook is, I always laugh at people that kind of say painting is dead, um, for example, because I mean, even when people compliment me on the fact I don't use, or I don't really rely on the history of art for my work, I even think, I'm always like, doesn't that sound funnier to you? Because when was, has art always had to be something that needs art to exist? Um, and I, I even like find it fascinating when people seem surprised that, or they feel like my language is something fresh. And it just, I think that says more about the way that we think as artists or the way even academia has kind of put us in the direction where we feel, I don't know, it, it shouldn't, for me it shouldn't be so strange that I can make paintings without talking about painting. I mean, because I feel like... What about politics or, you know, kind of contemporary issues? Because there's such a yeah. strong sense of being a human being with your work and the human experience of the world. Mm. And yet there's no titles that relate to Brexit. But I think I think it's I think it's just I think that in that sense I don't I think because everything affects everything you do I think it's probably all there it's just it doesn't need to be talked about I think it should be obvious that probably Brexit did affect my work at some point I didn't need to really necessarily paint about Brexit to for my work to but you know it probably like gave me a hiccup in my own thought process when I was living those few months after that Brexit vote. And just because it, it isn't described in the painting, I think, you think every artist is kind of, the, when they have their moment in history or whatever they've experienced in life, it's, I think it's always present in retrospect. I think it's, it's, you are able to discuss that when you look at a larger kind of framework, if that makes sense, and maybe you could identify those things. But I could be wrong. Um, I'm not sure. Um, it's but interesting, someone like Bono, I'm looking at the show, mm. the fact that war was mm. happening all around him, mm. that was yeah. Have you seen the Bono show? No, I have not. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, 
the talk took an amazing time when I was out. Yeah. I came in and everyone was yeah. talking about Brexit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No. My question might relate to that slightly. Yeah. I remember the first painting of yours I ever saw was in that Gloucester show in Peckham in 2016. Oh my gosh, yeah. And then, like, that painting didn't look a lot like these paintings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was wondering if you could talk a bit more. When Ingrid introduced this show, she said it's very mature work. And I agree with that. Mm. Assessment and it's happened in a very short space of time. Mm. So you're talking about three what, years ago. Three years ago, yeah. 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 So what well, happened to make the, that breakthrough? But I, I, because people always actually even say that your work's very mature. I don't know what that means though. Mm. What makes the work mature? I mean, I think that's quite an ambiguous yeah, term. No, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I, so I think it means that it kind of looks comfortable in its own skin and. Uh, yes, and confident, authoritative, believable. Yeah, I like mm. the believable thing is really mm. interesting. It's got a lot of conviction. Well, comparing like, the painting from that exhibition you talked about, I felt like then I was very held back by probably the whole atmosphere of art school. I think mm. I, I felt like I was overthinking everything and having to d defend everything without knowing anything or what I wanted. And I feel like that environment can really put a constraint on the work. And it wasn't until I went to Japan and came back and I was just so fed up. Yeah. Like just releasing myself of all that prob is probably what makes the work feel mature to other people. It's like once I let go of that kind of inner kind of parent of <laughs> what, what painting should be or what yeah. painting. But it's so funny because you're, 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 full, you're not even false, but it feels like you have to understand question all those things without even knowing what you want yet. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's no, no, quite no, that, a strange that, that's, environment. That's a very good way of putting it, mm. yeah. I mean, that is an odd thing about <laughs> art school education, but maybe it's an odd thing about education generally, that mm. you are pressured, pressured to, to contemplate and come up with answers for things when you're not fully formed as a person. Mm. So you're, yeah. uh, if, if we ever are, yeah. but I mean, you're still forming as a yeah. person, that is. And especially if, as I understand it, you didn't come from a family where art was particularly in the culture. There wasn't a culture of art. So mm. a lot of your mates at the Slade probably went to shows with their parents, you know. Yeah, but I'd be, I, I would have a sake to say all of them. But even following on from that point, I remember one of the things that led up to that moment of like, oh, I, I'm fed up of even like questioning myself one, so much is even developing as a person you always feel like you have to know who you are before you've even done anything. Or That's you, kind you, of the way it works. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it feels like, it's an awkward stretch, yeah. but I can't think of any other way. Yeah, it but, but it's funny because that kind of inherent nature to always feel like you have to be able to present yourself as something, even from a even from like early teenage, when you haven't right, even yeah. really experienced anything, I'm actually sure, hinders yeah. you realizing who you are naturally and I remember yeah. this was part of why Japan really changed everything for me because I, I, I was so exhausted from putting myself down for thinking that the way I naturally was what I wasn't allowed to be because right. was it the thing yeah, right? or yeah because the things that people considered flaws I couldn't help and then suddenly it was like like what like actually but why are they flaws or like what oh like what oh name a flaw <laughs> <laughs> uh, greedy <laughs> Gluttonous? I don't know. Yeah. I don't really want to like tell right. people. All my so, <laughs> so character. Like, you went to Japan after you went to the Slade, yeah. Yeah. So did, when you were at the Slade, did you feel people thought you had flaws? I mean, no. I just think uh, people know your. You know internally the things that you're not going to admit. I mean, sadly for me now, I've admitted it to the whole internet <laughs> because this will be online. But it was more of an exhaustion of. There's some things you can't change, mm. and part of trying to figure yourself out is also trying to suit this ideal human being, what it is to be good, bad, or negative and positive, and sometimes accepting your flaws and embracing them can be the most liberating aspect of figuring yourself out, just like that's how I figured my paintings out. Yes. I think you're so truthful. Yes. You Thank know, you. I mean, that's what people respond to. I mean, if it was bullshit, mm. they wouldn't. Yes. You know what I mean? yeah. like Thank you. Well, I think we're all... I'm also Ooh. nice and I've got to balance it out a bit. <laughs> sure, everyone feels very privileged to have 
<laughs> you thinking aloud about yourself and the development mm. of yourself and in the context of paintings which are somehow in some marvelous way related to that mm. self-discovery process. You know. mm. It's been lovely talking to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody coming along. Um, fantastic. I, I, just, I just like the way you kind of drilled in on how do you make the work. Tell me about making the work. That was fantastic. <laughs> and I think you enjoyed it. Tonight. Well, yeah, 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 I got really into it. Generous talk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful to see you enjoy yourself. Yeah. Not there. Um, I just also wanted to, I, I, when I printed my notes off to introduce you, I printed, well, yours off your Wikipedia page and yours off the Pippi Holder Academy. So, of course, they didn't even mention Pippi because it came off their website. But I also wanted to say thank you, Pippi, who's not here tonight, and the gallery for a fantastic support. Um, and if, if, if we want to continue the conversation, there's a little bar which we will excuse us. You can get a drink and bring it back in the gallery and we'll chat for the next half an hour. So that's a good way to round off. Yeah. Thank you very much.